thanks for coming. I'm Anna Shaw, I'm the Library Director at the Beaverton Library, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jim Zabrowski and John Root, who are here to discuss the legacy of the column. Hi, thank you very much for inviting us to the library, the Beaver Memorial Library here in West Boylston. Uh, I'm gonna grab my little clicker here. And we're going to be off and running. This it takes about one hour. It's kind of a generalized overview of not just the Apollo landings. I think it's more significant to say it's the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 landing, but in between there, there's how did we get there? How did we reach out and decide we're going to go be space service? And how did it all start? So that's kind of my theme overall, and basically just kind of a sum summation of the whole program here. So my name is Jim Zabrowski. I happen to be the current president of Aldrich Astronomical Society. John Root in the back is our library uh, telescope coordinator, delivering telescopes to libraries for adults to take home with them. All you have to do is show your card and smiling helps. Hi here. Anyway, <laughs> there we are. And we've got our symbol, the Aldrich Astronomical Society. We've been around here for 75 plus years, since 1932. Off and running. So, the important thing about getting into space, rockets, okay? How do we get those rockets to work? So you have a number of people associated with this, okay? First one was the Russian father of rocketry, yeah. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. And basically, I love all these quotations they come up with. Earth is the cradle of humanity, but one cannot remain in the cradle forever. 100% <laughs> agree with that. They were visionaries. He was more of a philosopher, a concept person. Uh, he, he, he was also good at rigorous math and defining some of the, math, uh, the mathematics for the rocketry principles, but he was more of a poet, visionary kind of slash everything. But the problem was he was in Russia, and at the time there was not too much exchange of information between Russia and the Western Hemisphere, so I don't remember him coming to my field of view until recently. Well, recently. Now, I always remember uh, Dr. Robert H. Goddard, Difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. Just remember, when you think all is lost, the future remains. And he was a pretty optimistic guy deciding, this is something I'm going to take seriously. This is something I'm going to dedicate my life to because it's worthwhile. And he had a lot of things to uh, uh, push in his face, including the New York Times and a lot of uh, newspaper people who kind of mocked him for these outlandish views uh, you can't, like the New York Times said, uh, Dr. Robert H. Goddard should know what every elementary high school student knows. You can't fly rockets in space. There's nothing to push against. <coughs> and Goddard's sitting there thinking, as his typical physicist, saying, they don't know uh, Newton's laws of motion. There's an action-reaction <laughs> principle going on, and nowhere does it say push against. So he did some experiments, reinforced the fact that it does work, and continued on with his efforts, totally ignoring the newspapers at the time. And then, of course, we had Herman Orbert, who I became aware of recently. Uh, he was Romanian, moved around the continent, eventually ended up in Germany, became a German citizen. And I like his statement, to make a li available for life every place where life is possible, to make inhabitable all worlds, as yet uninhabitable, and all life purposeful. And then we had a fourth individual, Werner von Braun. And von Braun was practical. Give me a team of good engineers and technologists. I'll get you to the moon. I'll get you to Mars. I'll build a space station. Okay? So his attitude, I'm an engineer, so I can understand that. Research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. Perfectly <laughs> identified with him, right? You can't argue with that. And I also love this. When he joined over here and came over to America, we can lick gravity, but sometimes the paperwork <laughs> is overwhelming. Okay, so think about that. And we go on from there. And I'm just going to concentrate a little bit on our local, uh, local hero, Dr. Robert Goddard. He really promoted the idea of space flight when it was sci-fi fantasy. And it was, it was mocked by serious uh, uh, scientists. No one really kind of owned up the fact that we'd ever go in space. But already, this is 1924. This is a blackboard at Clark University. Uh, basically, you can see the Earth, a uh, lunar balloon, distance to the moon is spelled out here, limit of the atmosphere. He was estimating 200 miles at that time, and how are we going to get up there? So he was taking it very seriously, but you've got to start somewhere. And here he is as a young person, basically, in Auburn, Massachusetts, around 1894. And um, 
He basically linked up with his Aunt Effie, and uh, she told him to get up to the top of that uh, tree, prune the branches, and of course, as you know, you third kind of get the message, but not quite follow through is the problem. And he was like that. He'd climb up to the top of the tree and look off in the distance and see the outskirts of Auburn, climb a little higher, see the outskirts of Worcester, look up, what about the moon? Or, better yet, Mars. And from that day forward, he was never the same. It was October 19th, 1899, and that was his day of de determining his destiny forever. Every year after that, he uh, celebrated that date. And he was pushing everything forward to go into space after that point in his life. Anything he needed to do to accomplish it. And Goddard basically, he, he wasn't satisfied with just coming up with ideas and filing for patents. He would design the combustion chambers. He would develop rocket nozzles. He would apply the D-level uh, engine nozzle uh, principles to his rockets. And he actually built a platform, which they still have locally at Clark University. And you can kind of see what this looks like. And I have to admit, I'm from Honest State. I read a book about Goddard, fell in love with Dr. Goddard early on, drove around applying for jobs here locally, went by Auburn. I go, why don't I remember that name? Auburn, Auburn, Auburn. Occurred to me about a couple months later, Dr. Goddard. You know, I couldn't believe it. And then, of course, I visited that area, and they have a little memorial park there. But this is the actual launch platform. And, I, and I, I've seen this before, and, and I could never figure out, this is the rocket. It's going to go up through and hit, what is this? What, what is that, two rockets? I don't, I, don't, I don't understand the design. Not two rockets, one rocket. Remember, no one did a liquid propellant rocket before God. This is the rocket. These are the two feed chambers. This is an alcohol kind of uh, um, igniting point here. So you have a long stick with an open flame. You basically ignite that filament there. This starts the whole process, pressurizing the chamber. And by the way, what looks like a rocket below, that's actually a blast deflector. Okay, because all your uh, uh, mixing of the, uh, the uh, oxidizer and the fuel is down below, pumping it up above to the nozzle where it ignites. So that's the process. So now it becomes a little bit under, more understandable, but everyone's still staring. Why would you put the rocket nozzle above, <laughs> you know, the propulsion mechanism? Remember what I said last night, Jim? Yeah, yeah. In his day and age, the horse was in front of the car. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah, and then maybe. But I, I keep telling people, no one had ever developed this before. No one ever thought about anything other than solid propellant rockets. So he was in the forefront, and here's right after his uh, launch, and I got to hand it to Esther Goddard, his wife. She basically followed him around, basically documented, a videographer of photography. This is the first flight, March 16, 1926. We actually visited the site out there and celebrated that day. Uh, Pakachok Golf Course is where the memorial is currently, and we did a recent uh, reenactment and launching of a model of the Saturn V, and I actually achieved a successful water landing. <laughs> so, not that I intended to do it, but I landed in the pond. But there you go. And then, of course, you can see he really makes a lot of major success in pushing forward the design of his rockets and steerable fins and things of this nature. And, of course, after being told to leave Auburn because of explosions and all kind of rocket, rockets going kaboom, which happens when you're doing research, uh, he ended up out in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, I guess it was Guggenheim, right? And we had uh, Lindbergh with supporters of him, and he, uh, he and his uh, colleagues went out there along with his wife, and they filmed a lot of these rocket launches, and he became the father of modern rocketry. He didn't live beyond 1945, very short lifetime, it's unfortunate, to see all the, the uh, success he had. So he launched rockets up to 1.6 miles in height and hit speeds of 550 miles per hour, and I got it. I just, usually I got a lot of kids in the audience, and I tell them 550 miles an hour is high. And they're going, no, 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 it's not that. I says, the highest speed plane was a P-51 during World War II, and that was 350 miles an hour. So you gotta understand, 550 miles an hour was pretty significant. When you see something like that coming at you, <laughs> you're gonna think twice about flying in an airplane. 
And then, of course, here's the colorized version of Goddard in the launch platform, and I'm not sure how that came about. And here's the diagram where you can see the igniter up above, the rocket motor, the needle valve. I mean, you get, every one of these things were designed by him. They, you couldn't go off the shelf. Abishans, can you give me a rocket nozzle, make it steerable, you know, be lava kind? Um, so he had to come up with all this on his own. And, and then he patented it. A lot of the stuff he came up with patents there. So his patents were spread worldwide, and uh, a lot of the uh, success in rocketry was attributed to Goddard's uh, initial work and development work. And of course, I have put this in because I keep telling them they still have it, and there I am with, uh, we have uh, Lauren Monroe, basically from Technicopia, and her colleague here, and Fordyce, she's the librarian at Clark University, and she was nice enough and generous enough to invite us out back where they reassemble this and they put this on display when we were celebrating the anniversary. So, I thought it was cool. World War II, okay. This I did not know. I knew Von Braun was very much involved. He was a colleague, or his mentor was uh, basically from an orbit. And uh, all of a sudden, the student became better than the teacher. And he really got into this. And he was known by the German authorities for joining rocketry groups and launching rockets. And the thing with Von Braun is everything went faster, straighter. Uh, had less explosions than any of the other rocketeers at the time, so they quickly enlisted in him. But the thing I didn't know, the first one didn't take off in almost the middle part of the war, March 23rd, 1942. Really kind of amazing. So there, and I missed that was Bernard von Braun. Oh, that's terrible. I just noticed that here. But at the end of the war, he decided I'm going to surrender to the Allies rather than the Russians who were advancing on his position. So he, and I think. Initially it was 400, and I think it ended up being 1,600 German colleagues, ended up basically uh, surrendering to the Allies, and they brought all the equipment and all the materials and all the know-how over the, the U.S. And as you notice, this is a fully assembled B-2. And that's not an extended nose comb. That is an Army WAC Corporal. It's a military weapon they had at the time. It was a missile, very reliable, and they decided to use the bottom part the V-2 as the first stage and the upper part as the second stage. And as I point out to people, not quite highly recommended to have a video crew that close to a rocket with explosive materials in it, but this was the beginning of experiments with uh, the technology of rocketry and getting into space. And of course, the first one that actually got into space because none of the V-2s left the atmosphere, they were all on a ballistic trajectory, which I also didn't know, it's interesting, February 24th, 1949, White Sands Proving Ground, New Mexico, both of them ended up above the atmosphere, the physical, uh, official designation for leaving the atmosphere of the Earth. Really quite amazing. And of course, Bumper 8, July 17, 1950, we're down at the Cape. This is the first rocket to launch from the Cape, and you can see it's already got the WAC Corporal up on top. And uh, the Cape was ideal because if you're launching rockets, unknown pedigree, doing experiments. If it's going to blow up, it's nice to blow up over the ocean as opposed to a populated area. But in addition to this, a lot of people don't understand, you're also adding the speed of the Earth's rotation at that latitude as you launch into space. So you're adding almost 1,000 miles to whatever the speed the rocket gains, getting yourself into space. So having Earth on your side is a benefit. So that's why it became very important to launch from the Cape. And of course, Werner, man, I'm a go-getter, man, in Germany. Had a whole crew working for me, put the rockets together. What do you want to do? Let's build the combustion chambers. And he got into a lot of trouble in Germany at the time because he was an advocate of uh, building a space station, exploring the solar system, and they pulled him aside and said, no, no, military weapons only. So now he's with the Allies. He said, now they'll listen to me. No. <laughs> they didn't listen to him. They signed him to low-level uh, people, uh, basically, in the military. And he was kind of restrained a little bit. He felt it was kind of not, not listened to a lot. Um, and, uh, but he basically kind of blended in with the uh, NACA group, which was exploring, um, uh, basically, information about aircraft and things of that nature. And then he saw, decided to himself, you know what? I bet you I can convince you, meaning the audience, more than my superiors about what it's like to go into space and why we need to do that. And that's what he did. Collier published a series, of, and this is only a, a brief snippet, but imagine that. 
No one ever heard of going into space, and all of a sudden, the color, uh, uh, basically, Chesley Boss, uh, there's a couple of uh, artists, basically, that were, at the time, drawing these fantasy visions of what it would be like into space, and they had all this, but look at this. That kind of looks like a lunar lander there, and he's talking about pressurized suits. Why do you need pressure suits to go and explore space? So he's doing this with uncanny accuracy and publishing all this. Then, another person who was very into communicating with the public, he found out about Werner von Braun. And they both linked up and really had a good relationship. Walt Disney, Tomorrowland. Remember a place called Disneyland? He was just putting together. And I remember as a young person basically sitting up Sunday nights, waiting up for this program where we're talking about tomorrow landing, launching space rockets and exploring. And it was the International Geophysical Year in 1958, so it was really important. So he got the year and the uh, attention of Walt Disney. New development. OK, everyone ready? Beep, 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 overhead. OK, what's going on here? How come the Russians are up there over our heads with a spacecraft? And uh, it's doing research up there. How come the United States didn't get involved in that? Eisenhower was very familiar with what was going on here. Uh, they had some discussions amongst the uh, high uh, brass in the military at the time. How far does the United States go? How far does Russia go? In other words, how far into space is the de demarcation of your territorial you know, boundaries? Will they shoot us down if we want something like that? to shoot at our planes, so what's the conditions on which we can do that? So there was an argument all of a sudden. This got launched, and we said, okay, because we wanted to basically not hear any feedback from the Russians when we launched this satellite and went over their territory. A lot of people didn't know about that, and that was being discussed. But Eisenhower said, calm down, I know what's going on, not that bad. We're moving ahead with a non-military solution we're using non-military sounding rockets put together by Navy personnel called Vanguard. What's going on? Like a, a dog. Now they got living creatures orbiting above our heads. And we haven't even got anything on the launch pad. What is happening? Congressional committees are formed rapidly, and you know how that, those things go. And uh, so they were very upset that, but Eisenhower reassured the public, don't worry, we're going to move ahead. And yeah, we moved ahead four feet off the ground, collapsed, buckled, and there's the three-pound satellite that kind of bounced out of the balls of flame as everything exploded on national TV. And you know where we had Sputnik overhead? Uh, this was dubbed by the press as Kaputnik. No. And, uh, that, and then Eisenhower felt the pressure. A lot of people were pointing at him and what's going on. And then all of a sudden, somehow or another, and I don't know the exact details, uh, Bernard von Braun and his crew came to the forefront. We can put something in orbit very quickly. He's been working with a number of people, including people from JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We're ready to go and get something up within two months. You're in charge now. Go do it. And he and his crew, guess what? They did it. William Pickering, the first head of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. James Van Allen, a very prominent scientist, discovering the Van Allen belts, the radiation belts. And Berner, who right there lifting a model of the Explorer satellite over their head. And they did launch it within a few months, January 31st, 1958, as part of International Geophysical Year. And I remember that was important because they wanted to downplay the significance of military involved in outer space, OK? We wanted to explore space peacefully. So this was very important to Eisenhower. And when basically the first uh, uh, instances of aircraft taking to the air and causing havoc on the battlefield in World War I. They formed NACA, the National Advisory Committee of Aeronautics. That was formed in 1950 in response to the newfangled contraption called an aircraft. Well, now we got orbiting satellites, and so now we want to form a new agency called NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, to take care of that new venture on the outer space. So that's the birth of NASA. So it's the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing, the 60th anniversary of the formation of NASA. And of course, we have a new president now. And he's very young, he's very dynamic, he wants to inspire the country, goes before Congress, urging national needs. 
really amazingly detailed speech, but he wants to send astronauts to the moon and return them safely to Earth. And at that point, we had Shepard go up, Alan Shepard go up in a Mercury capsule in a ballistic trajectory, 15 minutes up and down. Meanwhile, the Russians are orbiting multi uh, spacecraft above our head with people on board and uh, multiple persons that were involved in their spacecraft. So there was a lot of challenges technologically for us to move ahead. And the United States was viewed as technologically behind the uh, curve at the time. So he wanted to really promote this idea, let's move ahead and inspire the youth and our young people and our generation to go ahead and do this. And then, of course, we had the Mercury 7, and uh, we finally did get Gus Grissom went in another uh, ballistic trajectory up over 15 minutes, and followed by um, Glenn, which orbited on Friendship 7. And this is John Glenn inside the capsule, February 20th, 1962. So we finally achieved success with the Mercury program. And here we go. And I, I couldn't believe this, but they said, okay, we'll spend money to beat the Russians because we know democracy is more important than communism. So, okay, it's a little Cold War back and forth. So he says, okay, appropriate the money, $1 million first year. Following year, $325 million. Where are they going with this? Very little. And then Kennedy gets a little nervous because all of a sudden, the dollars are starting to add up. It's costing a lot of money. So he started poking, and I, I didn't know that until just recently. He started poking on the side with Khrushchev at the sign and says, hey, maybe we can collaborate. <laughs> you know, pick out the shoe, pound it on the desk, and go, wait a minute. We're orbiting above your head with multi-satellites. You're sitting here on the ground, you got one guy up for three hours, big deal, for three orbits of the Earth. So he, he basically kind of pushed it off. So Kennedy pushed ahead, did his big speech in the Rice, University or Rice Stadium there. And this was a lot of things were going on, including the recent Bay of Pigs fiasco. So there's a lot of politics involved in doing it. So you can't disassociate going into space peacefully uh, from the politics of the time. And actually, this pushed it ahead. So Kennedy says, We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they were easy, but because they were hard. So he's pointing out there at his audience including a lot of young people. I'm not going to the moon. You guys are going to help us go to the moon. He wants to inspire the generation. I'll tell you, man, I, I stood right up and listened. That was really quite amazing to be able to hear that. Exploring space, imagine going to the moon. Imagine orbiting the Earth. This is really unbelievable, unheard of. But it cost money. And he did approach Khrushchev again. And he did kind of do a little back and forth. And Khrushchev said, you know, Maybe we should do this, because now Khrushchev was also realizing a lot of money. So he took a tour down at Cape Canaveral. He wasn't too confident we were going, we actually could do it, technologically. Okay, so there's James Webb, the head of the agency at the time, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was his right-hand man, and also knew a lot about space, giving Kennedy information. McNamara was there. But Kennedy really did a lot of work behind the scenes and had a lot of good, astute questions. But the key man, right during that talk, Werner. Werner was a good salesman for basically getting us into space. And he basically talked to Kennedy, and Kennedy was elated and just discussing with him, showing the brand new Saturn 1B with the rocket engines. And there was a story of Kennedy down at the Cape during a rocket firing. And I guess they were something like two and a half miles away. And Kennedy at the time, no, no one had seen a rocket this gigantic before, two and a half miles away. Kennedy remembers his pant leg flapping in the breeze and the back part of his leg burning from the heat of the engine from two and a half miles away. He went, wow. <laughs> I mean, who, who could not say that, you know? Really quite amazing. Plus, Werner was a good, eloquent speaker promoting exploring space. And of course, astronauts. First-hand experience. They talked them. So they had Gus Grissom here, Gordon Cooper, and uh, they convinced them this is the right way to go. So he says, Let's forge ahead, let's go ahead, we'll keep the thing with the Russians on the side. If we need to do it, okay, we'll keep that in the background. And that was never let out. Unfortunately, this was eight days before his assassination. So as a result of the death of a very young and dynamic leader, 
we all of a sudden found ourselves, gotta remember him, let's go to the moon. He started us on the path. Can we do it? So we have the Mercury 7 here, dressed up in their spacesuits here, ready to go into orbit. Uh, so they had a number of people. Glenn was uh, important, uh, Alan Shepard, uh, Gus Grissom, Gordon Cooper, I think it was Don Carpenter, and uh, Deke Slayton was one of the originals in there. And Ed White, shortly after they had this under our belt, saying we can, in fact, launch a human being into space, now you have a two-man spacecraft. Ed White was able to get out and step outside his craft, and now he's in a pressure suit with a nitrogen gun and shooting around and doing puffs of nitrogen around there, and he's going, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. I mean, he is just <clears throat> elated being in space. And in fact, NASA was kind of, this is a very serious scientific experiment, and he's jetting around out there, and they're trying to convince him to come in, and they're calling his partner, and I can't remember who was on board with him at the time, but he was trying to convince him to come in, but he was having such a blast out there. And he eventually did come in. But it just proved humans could survive in the cold darkness of space with appropriate suits. And at that point, he worked out quite a bit of sweat in here. So they had to come up with these cool undergarments with the circulating water to take away all the heat generated by working in space. And, uh, but this was our first experience with this. Next experience. If we're going to go to the moon, we're going to go in multi-vehicles. We're gonna to have to find that other vehicle in space. Oh, did I tell you? Five miles per second, one vehicle, five miles per second in the other vehicle. Gotta find it, gotta link up. Five miles per second, did I mention that? Okay, that's important. So they launch an Ingena three hours earlier. Here's the Gemini Titan, which took the two-man capsule up, and you'll probably recognize some of the people on board. Someone by the name of Neil Armstrong and David Scott. Find the other capsule, dock to it. Dock to it multiple times, prove that we can find other spacecraft via radar and our mathematical models. He really did a good job. Docked with it very successfully. Unfortunately, shortly after docking with the Agena in space, they started rotating very rapidly, almost to the point of losing consciousness. Neil had to really throw some levers and buttons and switches to figure out what was going on, and he finally just said, okay, something's going on, we gotta take off from the Agena because it may be on the Agena. He pulled away from the Agena successfully, everything stopped for a while, and all of a sudden, rotating very rapidly. It was the Gemini. And I just found out recently, he did notice, there was no indicator light saying, oh, this is happening, so he had no idea what was happening, but he didn't notice his positioning rocket fuel indicator was down significantly. So he was guessing in his head. There was some stuck valve which was firing continuously outside, but he had no way to prove that, okay? They were about to lose consciousness. And uh, as Dave Scott said later on, uh, it was my kind of good luck to be teamed with uh, Neil Armstrong because Neil seemed to know where everything was and how to gain the con control of the spacecraft again. And he was smart enough to decide Okay, use the retro rockets, these 100 pound thrusters, which are kind of steering the spacecraft, they're not gonna work. This is really drastic, we need. So the powerful spacecraft reentry rockets were fired, and guess what? Got it under control successfully, landed in the ocean, and they later found out it was an open valve on one of the thrusters on the Gemini that was stuck. And to this day, they don't have really conclusive evidence to what caused it, but what did happen. But now they have indicator switches on the, on the dashboard, so he was, he came to the attention of NASA very early on because of his very strong skills in reacting to this emergency. Unfortunately, when you're exploring space, space can be very traumatic, very deadly, if you don't pay attention to every single detail. And uh, so, but no one, including me, because I, I was really heavily invested in this, Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chafee, they were just on a test uh, vehicle of uh, getting ready to launch with the first Saturn and with the Apollo 1 capsule and they were having a lot of problems with communication on the ground. It was a ground-based test, but it was a pure oxygen environment. A spark went off inside the capsule and they instantly went up in flames. And unfortunately, there was no way to open the, the hatch quick enough to rescue them. They were dead in an instant. So it was a very epic disaster. 
And even Neil Armstrong was very, very close friends with all these astronauts, but including Chafee. They built property together, they hung out together, so it was very devastating for the astronaut community. And then, when they started looking into it, as they always do after these accidents happen, the astronauts were in fact complaining. They said this Apollo capsule is not worthy of flight. There's a lot of problems with it. There's a lot of uh, faulty circuits in there, but we'll fly it. You tell us to go in space, we're going in space. So after that, guess what? Astronauts were put in charge. So that's why you found astronauts going across the whole country dealing with all the manufacturers. Everything that went into space was certified and checked out by an astronaut, okay? And he, they, they basically inspired everyone to get on board to support this whole mission and to have us succeed by getting into space successfully without injuring or losing any more life. The brand new capsule was Apollo 7. Wally Sharar was the commander, and uh, they proceeded ahead, launched up with a Saturn 1B in the low Earth orbit, and it was outstandingly successful. I guess they were up there for 10 days, everything worked good, other than the fact that the crew came down with a bad head cold. So that's when they started thinking about isolating the astronauts before going into space, so they wouldn't have to put up with something like that. And uh, perfect rollout. So they were now getting ready to launch Apollo 8 as a follow-up mission orbiting the Earth. And they're saying this is a follow-up mission in, uh, it was supposed to be April or March or April of 1969. The CIA approached NASA, released some information to NASA saying there's a giant rocket on the pad ready to launch. It looks like a moon rocket. The Russians are going for the moon. Is there anything you can do to speed things up and go to the moon first? Well, they call in Frank Borman. You want to go to the moon? And he's thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely moon. We're going to support the... Uh, no, no. He says, you're going to the moon. We're selecting you to go to the moon. Are you on board with that? It's the first all-up test flight of a Saturn V with human beings orbiting the Earth multiple times, firing an engine that has never been refired in space before, going out of low Earth orbit five miles per second, seven miles per second to go to the moon, and then orbiting the moon and coming back. So they were on board. And uh, that vehicle really had some rigorous inspection work. They uh, picked up all their uh, testing and all their um, checking out of all their materials they needed, and they were on board. And there's the moon with the giant Saturn V erupting in flame and taking off. And Frank Borman uh, was the commander, James Lovell, command module pilot, and basically William Andrews was the lunar module pilot. No lunar module at the time, still under development. And there's their uh, patch. Uh, Anders was ready to take some pictures, believe it or not, he had black and white film on, and then all of a sudden he saw this beautiful colored light coming up over the moon, limb of the moon as they were orbiting the moon successfully, and it was Earthrise, and he grabbed the color camera and uh, changed out the magazine, and he got this beautiful image of the Earth, and any astronaut going forward, looking back on Apollo, said what well, was one of the most significant things Apollo did for Earth, we had to leave our own home planet to look back and realize what a small, fragile ecosystem we live on, the Earth, with this beautiful, it's a beautiful blue marble is what they refer to it as. And that started all the Earth programs, Greenpeace and all that. Earth Day was started because of this picture, a very dramatic picture. And it was one of the most significant pictures because we had never seen a picture of the entire Earth in the voids of space from a distance like this, really significant. So and that's December 24th, and they read from Genesis, marvelous reading. I remember seeing that, and they had some video, primitive video cameras, which they showed up the windows, and you can see the craters flying by. It was really amazingly, uh, it was December 24th, and I remember sitting there during Christmas time just looking at the, the, the TV in disbelief. It was just amazing. And, of course, the engines fired successfully, brought them back to Earth, and uh, it worked. Now, we need that lunar lander. It's running behind schedule. Lunar lander, Apollo 9, put it up, went around the Earth over a 10-day period. Now they're starting to name the vehicles. You have Spider and Gumdrop, basically. So they're now identifying with the command module and the lander, and basically testing the engines, navigation systems, docking maneuvers, as well as back 
backpack life support systems for over 10 days in orbit. Now, it was essential to make sure we give this a shakedown cruise to make sure it would function. This is the first time a vehicle was created on the planet called Earth that was never meant to fly on Earth. There's no way they could test this vehicle on Earth. It had to be in space. It was a pure, unadulterated spacecraft. It was so thin, if you poke your boot right through it, you could go right through it. It was three sheets of loosely paper stacked together in a pressurized environment, okay? It's really perfectly suited for space, but you had to watch it here on Earth. Really quite amazing. And you can see the extenders there, basically for remote sensors, so they can tell when they were landing on the moon. They knew ahead of time when to shut the engines off, because that would touch first. That's about a three-foot sensor below each of the packs. That was an important thing they did up there. And now Apollo 10. Now we're going to send the lander on. You're going to have to dock together, and you're going to leave the Earth. And you're going to head off to the moon. Okay, seven miles per second. They successfully docked up together. Uh, they orbited the moon uh, very successfully, and they tested out all the systems in moon orbit. They got down as low as, uh, I think as low as 10,000 feet, uh, and then fired the engines, separated from the lander portion, came back and joined it up the capsule, and they found a number of problems with the radar, or some problems with communication channels. Uh, there were four or five major problems that it came up with because of this mission. Any one of those problems would have canceled Apollo 11. They would have just said, no go, bring it back. But because they found these out early, they made the adjustments and changes in Apollo 11. And there it is. And that was Tom Stafford, Eugene Cernan, John Young, and it's the 50th anniversary was this May, and Charlie Brown is the uh, command module, and Snoopy is the lander. And the cool thing about this is any quality mission that NASA has for any vendor working for them, they're kind of given a special award called the Snoopy Award for high quality components. And I guess Schultz basically said it was okay to use the peanut characters to do that. He was on board with the exploring space using peanuts and Snoopy to this day remains part of the space exploration effort with Snoopy Awards being offered to any vendor who really does an outstanding job in quality. And of course, you know, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin with those Snoopy hats. I mean, what else are you gonna call them, right? with the communication gear on the side. And here we go, we're off and running. The Saturn V, what can I say? Awesome. It is an amazing vehicle, uh, 363 feet tall. Uh, we have 33 foot diameter uh, lower stage here. And I always tell kids if they're in the audience, but this is a good thing to know you could divide, uh, drive two of those long extended school buses with the big outstretched mirrors right down the center of the tube and not touch. That's how much space is inside. And you gotta understand, all this was fuel, basically. 6.8 million pounds of vehicle to launch 110,000 pounds of astronauts and landers and command modules to the moon. Uh, really quite amazing. And you had this special crawler that was able to kind of lift this vehicle up and crawl down over an eight and a half to nine hour span down to the launch area, and of course it has to go up this incline, and the engineers figured out, well, you gotta make sure that's on the level because it weighs 6.8 million pounds, you know? Very heavy duty rocket. So basically, uh, you're basically lifting it up. Uh, I think they, they, I'm trying to remember. But anyway, they had jacks in the back of the, the crawler, so the jacks would keep the whole vehicle level. So that big superstructure that it was supporting up the top would basically, uh, be held level. And I did just remember now that the fueling was done right at the uh, launch site. So, but still, that's a lot of weight to carry on the back of that rocket. And most of it is in the form of fuel. 7.6 million pounds of thrust to get this vehicle off the ground. Really quite amazing. Here. And you can see on Neil Armstrong, we have Michael Collins, a technician. Around the corner is Buzz Aldrin. This is the catwalk. They go up to the level even with the space capsule board on board. Perfect day for a liftoff, July 16th, 1969. Really amazing, thunderous roar of the engines. It took 9.6 seconds for the engines to come to life. And uh, people, people there said it was almost like a flash of light three times brighter than the sun. Eight and a half to 10 seconds later, you were vibrating, the ground under you was vibrating. And they said it was a 4.6 on the Richter scale. Love this picture. 
finally accelerating to the densest part of the Earth's atmosphere. You can see the vapor cloud forming around it. Ah, what can you say? Love it. And then they followed up. Another beautiful picture of the rocket. And of course, the chase plane was following. This is a 700 foot long plume from that first stage. That first stage fired for about two minutes and 30 seconds or so. The engine shut down. It was very noisy. A lot of vibration. Uh, it was like a runaway roller coaster, as they described it. Uh, when it shut down, they discharged the bottom part of that rocket, which was empty, no longer needed, so they discharged it. The upper part had a new type of engine. It was called hydrogen fuel. More efficient, quieter firing engines. They fired it, and you could hardly see any smoke coming off it. People didn't even know it ignited. And it went and took the astronauts into space. And the astronauts all said, boy, second engine, second stage on. Smooth going into space. Really quite an amazing flight. Orbit the Earth, one and a half flights. Successfully docked, got to the moon. On dock from Columbia, which was the command module, and the Eagle separated, and this is what you saw. This is a whole view. This view here is the window outside their spacecraft. Now, I gotta warn people that all you had during landing day is audio. You had to use your imagination of what was going on. So they had some kind of graphics at the time. But this is what the astronauts saw. They filmed it, and you're gonna see that film today. But at the time of the landing, all mission control here is is what the astronauts are saying and what's going on. So here we go. Eagle, you're looking great. Coming up nine minutes. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 5,200 feet. Manual attitude control is good. Roger, copy. Altitude 42. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. Roger, anything. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Top alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. We're go. Same tide. We're go. 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. Yeah, the people on the ground degrees. responding yeah. to the alarms telling Armstrong, you're safe to go. Don't worry about it. Armstrong didn't know what was going on. That's the leading with that. Eagle looking great. You're go. Level one flow will do. Overloaded radar. Altitude 1,600. 1,400 feet. Still looking very good. Roger. 1202. We copy it. 35 degrees. 35 degrees, 750, coming down to 23. 700 feet, 21 down, 33 degrees. 100 feet, down to 19. 540 feet, down to 30, down to 15. Now, this is the point 400 feet, down to 9. Stay forward. 350 feet down and four. Thirty down. Hovering, down. Down. Yeah, uh, on, uh, on velocity. Standard feet down three and a half. Forty seven forward. Hold up. On one and a one and a half down. They were right in the boulder field area. Boulders were about the size of houses. So they had to overfly the area and kind of look spiraling down as they were down a two and a half safe, smooth, I think forward. And it was Altitude along the edge of their landing. Three and a half down, two twenty feet. Thirteen forward. Five and forward, coming down nicely, two hundred feet. Four and a half down. Five and a half down. Six, 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 six and a half down, five and a half down. Yeah, that's the point we're stuck. Well, this is a revelation.
Thank you. You got better eyes than I have. I thought I put them nearby. I'll find out why this is stalling. It should not have stalled. Okay. Okay, where's the landing? I apologize. I don't. I, I think I understand what's going on here, but too late to fix it. Okay, I don't think I'm gonna make that mistake again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you gotta go with the flow sometimes here. And um, once it locks up, I found out, and it was a combination of cords. And today, I think it's just. Doesn't like HDMI. Something in the HDMI setup is not working right. Okay. So now I gotta start it again, but I know where I stopped. Okay. Got this going. Any questions to date uh, to on the program? Uh, I'm going to start it again. Thank you. And uh, coming up. Look at the size of the rocket and the people, the scale wow. in the background. Isn't that amazing? Uh, it's, yeah. sure. I know you just stare at that and you go, boy, oh boy, that gives you a sense of the size and scale of what you're talking about. And imagine three people sitting up on top trying to remain calm. <laughs> I got to hand it to them. They said uh, some of the astronauts' heartbeats were like 90 beats per, per, per minute, and I'm going, oh boy. <laughs> Mine would have been off the scale. <laughs> Uh, so I'm just waiting for my program to come up, and then I will start from where I left off. In, in your audio, you, you'll hear the engineers telling the astronauts yes. how many feet until they hit the ground, but it's the astronauts are literally flying the vehicle at this point. The vehicle flies itself to a certain point when a pre-programmed program, and at a certain point, it tips over and allows the astronauts for the first time to see where they're going. And it's at that point, in other words, there's a series of sequential events that are happening until the astronauts have the vehicle going straight down in what is known as the helicopter or hover mode. And it spirals into the landing site. And at that point, when it tips over, Neil sees he's heading to a, a field of boulders. So at that point, he takes over. And this is the point at which I kind of join the program here. Uh, I'm, basically, we know the landing it took place very successfully, but that's exactly what happened. And uh, it was just amazing. Uh, he had a lot of skill, and uh, he basically was able to get it down on the ground. And uh, they uh, talked to uh, Aldrin later on, and <laughs> he was saying, were you a little worried? Because as they were getting closer and closer to the ground and nothing was happening, and you imagine this, we're looking at video. The video wasn't there. That's film that was developed after they came back to Earth. So all the people down on Earth in mission control now is whatever they're hearing back in their headsets. Something was like in the, the bus driver, they were talking about the fuel situation in the, the descent versus the ascent stage. So in the, in the book, they talk about there was only so many seconds or whatever it was of, in the fuel in the... Yeah, they're talking the, purely the descent, descent stage. But they would have had to make a certain point where they would have had a Back up for the, right, right, right. They, they the first the thing they got to do is they got to get rid of that bottom stage, but that bottom stage has still got fuel in it. Yeah. And they landed with 17 seconds of fuel left. So there was a certain point at which uh, you didn't hear this clearly in this snippet that I provided here, but there's a uh, um, Gene Kranz oh, okay. was one of the mission controllers yeah. at NASA. And he just says, okay, everyone, no one talks. You, time. Time in fuel left, 60 seconds, 45 seconds, 30 seconds. You hear that in the background. And they were touching down. He says 30 seconds. He's only 90 feet up. They don't know that, yeah. basically. And he's spiraling in, trying to make sure there's nothing under that nozzle or nothing under the pad where he's going to land over and tip over. And he knows he can do it. We don't know that here on Earth, OK? And there's one point at which, after he lands, he says, you got a bunch of guys here on the ground about to turn yeah. blue because, you know, we're just frightened to death, and we didn't realize how close it was. But you can actually see the probes, the shadow of the probe coming down and touching down, and you can see the dust kicking up. Now, of course, Aldrin and Armstrong see that. Mission Control doesn't see that, because they're, they're not verbalizing. You know, they're, they're watching their gauges. And Aldrin, or, or Armstrong is very much aware of how much fuel was left. 
but he pulled it off because he knew he had to overfly those boulders. There's just no way around it. And then based on the fact that we're flying over the boulders, you're sitting here, what are you looking at? Over there. So now you're tilting and kind of spiraling down so you can kind of look underneath to know I'm landing not on a, not on a boulder or not on a big rock. So here they are, first steps. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the lamp foot beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder ground mass. Uh, it's very fine. And then a long one. And here's Aldrin coming out. And the last rung of the ladder is three feet above the path. So he's jumping three feet with this heavy spacesuit. Okay, I'm going to leave that one foot and up there. The first thing he does is, like Neil does, okay, jump down, down and now can I jump back up three feet with this heavy spacesuit to get back. And you'll, you'll see him do that. Okay, now I think I'll do the same. And that's the 16G. For those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, we'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamp. There's, there's two hemispheres, one showing each of the two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Here men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, B.C. It came in peace. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. And they're referring to Michael Collins above the command module. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. No problem. <laughs> hey, he's like, he says, I'm glad I'm on board, <laughs> even above you, because oh, I'm around the board. Mike, really is. Isn't that amazing? And they took a little while to put up the flag. The stage wouldn't yes, step it up, up and support it, so they let the middle stay up. They gave that nice, gentle curve to the flag on the airless moon, really kind of amazing. Even problems with the mission worked out for the better. <laughs> so here's some stills. You can see the probe I'm talking about. They actually cut the engine off, so they had to know when they were about three feet above the lunar surface, so the engines would be cut off. You couldn't continuously fire all the way down to the ground, okay? That would cause a lot of problems. So they shut the engines off three feet above the ground, and they just dropped to the ground very gently, and then bent those up. And here's what they were talking about. Uh, here men from the planet Earth set foot on, upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind. All three astronauts signed, and Richard Nixon, who was president of the United States at the time, signed. And that, that was important, promoted as a mission for all mankind in peace. And boy, we needed it during that time period. And here's the only picture taken in a series of 16 millimeter uh, frame uh, grabs of Neil Armstrong with his gold visor up, so you can actually see it's Neil in his uh, spacesuit. Uh, he never got a picture of himself on the moon. And there's a whole story around there. All the pictures you see of the astronauts on the moon, that's Buzz coming down the ladder. Uh, he put out the laser retro reflector, so now we know by bouncing a laser off one of these three laser retro reflectors that are on the moon, we can tell the distance between the Earth moon system within a fraction of a centimeter, and they're still fully functional now. Mirrors, basically, they don't wear out. And of course, we have the ultimate, ultimate picture of Neil on the moon. This is Buzz, and you can see in his gold visor, there's Neil, yep. and there's the lander. So I don't know. Uh, Neil was a very per, uh, private person, so maybe he's just kind of hinting and saying, yeah, I don't really need a picture, but I'm there. <laughs> but you're gonna have to work at it to find it. My opinion, you know. But here you go. And then, of course, the beautiful picture of uh, Buzz saluting the flag. And the, the other story I heard is that he gave the camera to Buzz and mm -hmm. take a picture of him saluting the flag, so the story goes. Uh, and then President Nixon called. And, of course, it wasn't a lengthy call, but it was enough to throw them off their game plan. And they thought the picture was taken. And then they went and deployed all the uh, equipment and experiments and went back up. And it was 28 days later they realized no pictures of Neil on the moon. Very, very, uh, I'm still trying to dig into it to find the ultimate, ultimate truth, but who knows. So Apollo 11 returns to Earth, basically lifted off, and as they said, they have a camera showing the liftoff, and unfortunately, 
Buzz forgets to set it for the first six seconds of the liftoff, and he says the first thing he noticed when the engine ignited, the blast tipped over the flag. So the flag went flying. He was too close to the <laughs> blast plume of the lunar module. So they're taking off, leaving the bottom part of the lander. And by the way, you did point out, someone mentioned here, uh, basically that there was fuel in the bottom of the rocket. The first thing they did before saying Tranquility Base, the Eagle has landed, they were venting the fuel and yeah. discharging the high pressure helium, which pressurized the fuel in the bottom. They had to get rid of that very quickly because if something was wrong and they had to immediately take off, you wouldn't want flames bursting yeah. on the bottom platform with fuel in the bottom. So the fuel was gone by the time they did that. So that was a safety measure. So that was a good point you made. Uh, yeah, you can see Columbia there and they joined up together. And I always love this picture right off the bow of the Hornet. They had it in the general side of suits. There was some, you know, fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent concern that they might bring back some germs from space, minimalistic. But I always tell people, what was the most important part of the mission? In other words, who got on the raft first? The moon rocks. <laughs> the moon rocks got first, and oh, you three astronauts, come, come on board. The moon rocks got there first. And then, of course, uh, they got on board their isolation area here, which was an airstream trailer and President Nixon. There was a lot of arguments there. They didn't want the president to be exposed to the danger of landing on an aircraft carrier, but no, he wanted to go. And he greeted the astronauts and uh, talked to them and saluted them, which was really quite amazing. And then basically, astronauts interviewed after the fact said, we were ready to go to the moon. We were ready to give our life for our country. We were not ready to go to 28 countries in 21 days and <laughs> do diplomatic things and yeah. salute people at uh, dinners three times a night, and they, they said it was exhausting, and just over their pay grade is what they were considering. So uh, and it, and it, it, it caused a lot of trauma in astronaut families at the time. So you do have the Apollo 11 spacecraft at the Smithsonian, and here's the picturesque quarantine facility, the Airstream that they had, that they had to spend uh, 21 days in before they were let out. And yeah, they did go to the moon. You can see the reflectometer, basically a retro reflectometer right there. You can see the footprints back and forth, the west crater. You can see the bottom stage of the lunar module. And they got better and better and sharper pictures to the point so where you go online, type in lunar landing sites, and you'll see the changing angles of the flag. So you'll see all the flags changing. So all the flags are up except for Apollo 11. And I think 14 has got a problem with its flag. So very quickly, patches for the remaining missions. We have Apollo 12, Alan Bean, who later became a very prominent painter, kind of illustrating what it was like to be in space. And once again, I love that gold uh, visor there where you can see Pete Conrad, his colleague in the, the visor. But you gotta understand, a lot of kids space there, why did they take this in black and white? Why did they not use color? Well, this was the time period where we were just starting to break out, where a good portion of the videos were shot at the time were black and white. You know, that was typical. Color was an added cost. And so a lot of the pictures from Apollo are black and white. And then, of course, we had the major uh, almost catastrophe with Apollo 13, where the command module exploded, uh, where they were pressurizing the tank, and a spark ignited and caused the fuel cell to explode. They almost died in space. They hunkered down, got them in a swing trajectory using the lunar module as a light bulb, brought them back to Earth successful. And they said of all the Apollo missions, that was probably the most outstanding rescue mission in the history of space flight. My favorite one, local town hero, Alan Shepard, right in front of live national TV. <laughs> he goes out with the lunar uh, grabber to pick up the moon rocks because astronauts can't bend over more than what I'm bending over right now because you're pressurized inside a spacesuit. So you have those extended grabber bars with claws and you grab the moon rocks up and you put them in bags. When he promptly unscrews the bag of the grabber, puts a driver head on it, puts a little white ball and drops it in front of the camera and goes, four, boom. <laughs> and then he goes, miles and miles and miles. And you see this white golf ball go off in the distance, okay? Uh, didn't really go that far, but he got the, uh, uh, basically, uh, significance of that was the furthest gulf stroke in the, in the whole solar system, I guess. So he's the uh, one that gets that credit. And uh, yeah, it was just a kind of a way of relieving tension. And he was an avid golfer here on Earth, so why not on the moon? Uh, and then, of course, we had the rover, which then further extended their capability of bringing back moon rocks, bigger rocks, all kind of things. They could drive up to the last mission, had 27 miles in space. This was the Apollo 15 rover, and they had the grill. 
And then basically we had the John Young's Grand Prix on the moon, and I told kids who were in the audience in one of my previous talks, uh, yeah, they were cruising along at eight and a half miles per hour, and the kids are yelling at me, that's not the Grand Prix. Grand Prix is hundreds of miles per hour. And I go, yeah, if you did 100 miles an hour on the moon, guess what? You would be in orbit. The moon is a lower mass body. You have one-sixth of gravity on Earth. Eight and a half miles per hour is probably optimal. You know, maybe push it a little higher than that, but they really get in. You can see he's rooster tailing and picking up a lot of moon dust here. And then, of course, here's the beautiful uh, rover on uh, Gene Cernan's mission, which was Apollo 17. They drove 27 miles in three days on the lunar surface. And here we have the only astronaut slash geologist uh, scientist who went to the moon, and he discovers, after looking at charcoal gray, light gray, dark gray, medium gray, gray moon pictures, all of a sudden he goes, there's orange soil here. And Gene's yelling at him, he says, oh, don't touch it, I want to see it. <laughs> and it was orange. Uh, apparently a volcanic fire found in the early history of the moon, fired off, and his uh, material landed right, right by the, where they landed. Imagine that, 4.4 billion years ago. And this is what it looks like under a microscope. I've actually seen that. I'm certified to handle the moon rocks to bring them to the public. And you can actually see these grains in the moon rocks. They're about a micron to two microns across, orange and black, really quite amazing. And it's a different aspect of looking at space exploration. Okay, so I, I figured I got two, two last slides. First slide, I'm just gonna let it run. And this is kind of, Kennedy really was very eloquent and he kind of pulls it all together, why go to the moon? And he was a very eloquent speaker and I forgot how much he said about going to the moon. So this, this is a snippet from his Rice University. We meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance, the vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished, still far outstrip our collective comprehension. But condense, if you will, the 50,000 years of man's recorded history in a time span of about a half a century. Stated in these terms, only five years ago, man learned to write and use a cart with wheels. The printing press came this year. And then, less than two months ago, Newton explored the meaning of gravity. Last month, electric lights and telephones and automobiles and airplanes became available. Only last week did we develop penicillin and television. This is a breathtaking pace. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high costs and hardships as well as high reward. So it is not surprising that some would have us stay where we are a little longer, to rest, to wait. But this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. All great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulty, and both must be enterprised and overcome with admirable courage. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. The exploration of space is one of the great adventures of all time. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. This generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. The
growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment, by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation, by new tools and computers for industry, medicine, the home, as well as the school. Space and related industries are generating new demand, investment, and skilled personnel. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said, because it is there. Well, space is there. And we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. The most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you. He was a very beautiful president, and I was shocked at how much I forgot and how dynamic a speaker he was. Uh, I was in uh, 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 high school at the time, and I'd rush home to listen to his news conferences because he was very eloquent and banter back and forth with the press, especially talking.